Next, there's someone who um, is, uh, well, not as young as Wakako, but uh, quite young and quite dashing. The executive director of NGO Forum on ADB um, joins us from Manila. And he will update us on COVID-19 recovery packages uh, that um, AIIB and ADB and perhaps other banks like the World Bank, uh, the New Development Bank, etc., are pushing all across. Um, you know, uh, every disaster is an opportunity for banks like these. And uh, he will also um, brief us on the recently concluded um, Asian Clean Energy Forum, ACEF 2020, which was organized by the ADB. Mr. Ryan Hassan, the mic is yours. Uh, thank you, Vidya. That was a lot of high praise late in the evening. I needed that, so I'll needed avoid it. sugar After for three dessert. webinars, yes, you needed that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but in your intro, you went over so many issues. I don't know in seven minutes if I'll be able to go into all of that. So, we'll give you one more minute if you will do justice, but you must do justice. Less is more, man. Less is more. I'll try to speak less. Uh, but um, just getting straight into it. Uh, a quick update on the recovery packages and the stimulus packages. Uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, new participants here, but some of you have probably heard all of this before, so uh, I will be guilty of repeating myself. On the ADB side, you have a $20 billion carved out COVID-19 recovery package. They announced it, uh, I think, May 16th, and already they have started co-financing in Bangladesh, they have started COVID-19 stimulus in India, they have started in Indonesia, in the Philippines. Uh, you have to really watch the fine print of these loans under the COVID-19 uh, recovery. So it usually has three or four components, regardless of which bank you're looking at, World Bank, AIB, or ADB. The first thing is it's designed for uh, health infrastructure and health recovery. So components of the loan is targeted towards building health infrastructure and addressing health needs. COVID-19 happened, America went into lockdown. The first stimulus by Trump was announced for which sector? Airline bailouts. So it didn't go to public health. It didn't go to uh, small and medium enterprises. It went to the airlines. Uh, if you look at Bangladesh specifically, and you go into COVID-19 lockdown, economic recovery, the first sector the government started talking about was the garment sector. And the billions of takas which were allocated was to make sure that the garment sector does not collapse completely. Now, obviously, when you look at the states, it's a very diverse economy with multiple sectors which are operating in the global market. So if one part of the economy collapses, other parts may pick up. Bangladesh does not have that luxury. It's a single economy uh, driven, single sector economy driven country, very much like Nepal and tourism or Philippines and overseas migrant workers, uh, Bangladesh garment sector. You know, that, that's the first thing which is gonna pop to mind in terms of bringing foreign currency reserves. So in a way, uh, I, would, I would probably echo what uh, Monwar Bhai is saying, that the budget, the budget is not reflecting the needs of the people, but the budget is reflecting the survival of the economy and a poorly structured and a poorly planned economy to begin with prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, why did we have that narrow vision? That's a completely different question for a completely different webinar. Definitely it. I'll just for one slide and bring this back down to the MDBs. Um, if you allow me, this is from uh, a little bit of touch upon the ASEF. So I, I did this presentation with the ADB a few days ago, Vidya moderated that, and uh, we were talking to the uh, director for the energy program of ADB headquarters. And we just flagged these figures down to them of where ADB was lending in its entire energy portfolio from 2014 to 2017. The data is from all change now. So if you look at the black line on the graph, that's the overall energy investment from 2014 to 2017. If you look at the blue line, that is what you want to focus on. It's on energy access. So power lines, distribution, transmission. Uh, 
the blue line is the national grid. That is off-grid, decentralized, renewable energy in far-off remote villages and islands where the poorest of the poor need access to electricity. And the last one is even more important than that, which is cooking and heating. Now, the, the United Nations Sustainable Energy for All, as well as the WHO, have both agreed that energy access and the lack of it directly led to more and more infections spreading around. There's a direct correlation between not having electricity and being vulnerable towards uh, being exposed to the pandemic. Why? You do not have access to hot water. You do not have access to healthcare. You do not have access to information about how to protect yourself because your phone's dead. You don't have Wi-Fi. You don't have electricity. Forget about the internet, right? So the entire question now, I guess on everybody's mind is energy access. And if you looked at Monorbai's presentation, we have overproduced. The country has thousands of megawatts of energy, but it has not provided access of that energy to the people. So where did this energy go and why did you make it? Now even your industries are collapsing. So this is not even a question of, sometimes I wonder, you know, is there like, an evil mind behind it, or is it just plain ignorance? And in some cases, it seems like it's corruption, it's poor political leadership, it's poor decision-making at the highest level of planning. All of that has contributed to the current crisis in which we are. So this is not only just about energy and the wrong kind of financing. This is just poor development planning, which did not look at the welfare of the people. So. That has to be up front and center in this discussion. So I'll just switch off my slide there um, because I'll end up talking at the slide. But what I wanted to do was probably talk a little bit about the social stuff. Um, we have been talking about energy, but we have not really looked at the impact of that on the economy and vis-a-vis -vis on society in the webinars that we have done with the Bangladesh Working Group, right? Um, so one of the things which I wanted to address on, and it was a news article which came out, which is just a simple, simple economic fact that inflation is leading for the Bangladesh Taka to depreciate against the US dollar, right? It's a simple, simple, anybody, even a, a child in grade five will figure that out, right? Or global trade has stopped and poorer economies will shoot up and the dollars going to balloon up the moment you break it down into local currency. So I remember before the pandemic, it was 79 taka for the dollar. Uh, right now, the banks are saying 84.9. That's according to the Bangladesh Bank, the central bank. Uh, commercial banks are even selling it off at 86 taka. Plus, the starvation for the US dollar is so high that private banks are now giving 2% rebate on remittances being sent. So that shows you the, the real hunger that we have because of the shutting down of the garment sector, because that was, our, that was our foreign currency generator. So anybody who wants to send money is now in a position that the government really wants it. So what are the figures? If you compare the figures of remittances and foreign currency, foreign currency reserve, Last year, we were at this time, $1.1 billion was coming into the country. Today, it's less than 200 million. And that is an alarming, alarming figure for the government to consider. Now, what does that have to do with impact on society? What, it, what was fascinating at the same time, heartbreaking to read, there's a sudden increase in child marriages in Bangladesh since the pandemic started. And the child marriages are, um, it's, it's illegal. I mean, we have a constitutional law against child marriages. And this is a draconian thing, which used to happen in the 80s when I remember I was a kid. It used to scare the life out of me looking at my friends in school. But now it's come back to haunt us again. And this was a recent study, a survey done by the BRAC Gender Justice. BRAC is one of the largest NGOs in the country. So they did this gender justice um, division survey, they looked at, they interviewed 557 people across 11 districts, 
72 people witnessed 73 child marriages. And I'll give you an example of one village in Kurigram. In Kurigram in February, there were 40 child marriages. In March, there were 29, there was 19 child marriages. In May, there were 33 child marriages. 62% of the husbands were overseas Bangladeshi workers who returned back with dollars. And that's your connection. The parents are so nervous and so scared and insecure about their children's future that they will marry them off to overseas Bangladesh workers in the hope that at least the dollar is way more stronger than the local economy. At least in the long-term future, there might be something for them to eat. And that is the psychology of the poor. And if we do not bring that into our climate advocacy and on our energy transition conversations, then we will be missing the plot. Um, my, my sentiments are pretty strong around this because I had a webinar on this issue really early in the morning. And I was talking to folks in the States, uh, Boston University folks, uh, Rockefeller Foundation, academics from JNU, who are all looking at energy transition and all of that. And we all came to the uh, conclusion that the Green New Deal does not apply for lower and middle income countries as it does to the West and the North. Because you need a multicolored deal. You cannot look at inequality and you cannot say that those jobs and those people who are working in the fossil fuel industry or the garments industry are not a part of your just transition. They have to be upfront and center at the part of that because of all the labor groups that we represent, if we leave them behind in our climate campaigning, then this is the scenario that you're gonna end up with. Child marriages everywhere. Overseas Filipino workers are begging outside my door. That's a reality. Jeepney drivers are begging outside my door. Jeepney runs on fossil fuel. If you tell me, all right, let's just transition Manila, get fossil fuel out, what is gonna to happen to that gypsy driver? So, so we really have to think about what's really happening at this present time in terms of economic recovery. And economic recovery and social recovery go hand in hand, as does the entire conversation of just transition. Now, if you go deeper into just transition, last minute. Um, then the it's last like, few seconds, actually. All right, yeah, yeah. I mean, I want to end on a positive note. It's been doom and gloom from my side. So uh, the solution is actually clean energy infrastructure and decentralized energy access. Uh, and there was an Oxford working paper which uh, Nicholas Stern, Joseph Stiglitz, and all these people surveyed 300 stimulus packages and they came down to the conclusion that clean energy infrastructure results in more jobs than traditional power generation and fossil fuel, seven times more. So is that the way to go, to make sure that we all bring in ourselves to a livelihood and a society which is really transitioning altogether as we are trying to cool the planet down. So just the, those thoughts coming from a poor country, we always talk more in ADDA format. So thank you for your time.